Welcome, 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 One Jamaica Bridge 99 FM. I'm very much here and I'm in studio and we have a lot of things lined up for you today. It's the last day of September 2021. So we're rolling towards Christmas. It's like, what, 90 days, a little over um, well, 90 days to Christmas. We have a lot lined up for you today. And of course, many things have happened. What a piece of thing I saw yesterday. That bike man riding his bike into the gully. Listen to me now, you know why them send people to school so you learn sense. And even so, people who ride bikes should know that the two spinning wheels of the bike have to keep spinning in the same direction or else you're going to drop. So using a bike to go into that gully that has washed away Pajeros and Prados and much larger vehicles when it looks just like that was for me quite an interesting decision regardless of how rushed you were. Listen to me now people, when rain falls in Jamaica take care. In a second the roads and the gullies are inundated take the long route. I mean I, I mean, I don't know what happened to the gentleman I saw the bike being fished out with a rope but people, that was an exercise in carelessness yes man don't do it. We don't want to have to be deploying the emergency situation, you know, um, resources to deal with situations like that. Take the long road. That gully washes away everything when it is in spate in that way. Please, eh? And we also saw, yes, during the day I was off, that Digicel has sent out a letter. People upset about it, eh? That um, the letter says that by the 15th of October, that's by the 15th of the upcoming month, that's about two weeks, just over two weeks, all employees need to present proof of either partial or full vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test every 14 days in order to continue attending work at the company. And remember, these COVID-19 tests that they're going to ask people to, pre to present will be at their own expense. So you're going to have to find $7,500 or so dollars every 14 days for the cheap test and twenty-two or $25,000 for the dear test. You choose, eh? Um, in an effort to safeguard the health of our organization, people and customers, employees should submit their vaccination cards to its human resources department by close of business on October 15. People, it's up to you. And this is not something that is only a local discussion. We see it happening all over the world, in New York and elsewhere. Companies are encouraging people, airlines, all these entities are encouraging subtly or, or pushing explicitly for their staff to get vaccinated or move and go about their business. And that's really what they're doing, you know. Because you can't be working in a situation where you're coming in and every time you go through the door, you start to worry if you're going to be exposed to COVID-19 because others in that in, in that entity, you don't know what they, what they are doing, what, what care they are taking when they are not in front of you. This is the situation, you know. And remember that many times when companies find a positive COVID test in their entity, it results in a lack, a lowering of productivity, cessation of productivity. People have to go home, stay at home, work from home, stop working during that hiatus period. So it's something that is important that we understand understand and um, employees will be not be allowed to work remotely as a means to take to avoid taking the vaccine or the test so they are clearly saying that you cannot do that and um, they are aware of the legal position in some of the markets and will deal with issues on a case-by-case -case basis so a lot of things are coming out of this timeline and the government is over one side you know but the government is not mandating anything. The private sector companies are the ones that are now putting this in, in other discussions around COVID-19. And remember, guys, we're talking about this in a situation where we are now, today is the day, I think, when the, just about 60,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine are set to expire. And today, today, right? So they are set to expire today. And this, all of this discussion is coming in the same timeline. And, and we are told that uh, AstraZeneca is one of the vaccines that is this batch that they didn't, do not have an extension on the expiry date because of what they saw in the lab with those. So then I got dash with 60,000 or so doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine while we are comp still dealing with the vaccine hesitancy. Eh? And, and so we continue with that discussion while the private sector companies in a lot of instances have been moving to ensure that they protect the enterprise that they are running. It's not just about this, the workers now. They're protecting the business because without the business being protected, the business cannot run. Um, and so the, in a lot of ways, the, the 60,000 doses of AstraZeneca, as we say, they expire today. Dr. Maurice Guy coming out of the opposition PNP is, of course, chiding the government for not starting the COVID-19 rural vaccination program earlier. 
with all things being possible. But of course, deep rural areas still continue to wait on access to the vaccine because of the challenges faced with getting it there. We're working to see what will happen. Of course, the British High Commission spokesman, Serana Baines, expressed disappointment yesterday that some of the donated vaccines will likely go to waste because they're expiring today. And um, the, we wonder how that will impact on the gifting of vaccines to Jamaica. Of course, this is the same United Kingdom that gift us the vaccine and then tell us that they are not accepting our... Listen to me now, people. We're not even on the horns of a dilemma. We don't drop off and go on down to the deep blue sea. When they give us the vaccine you know, and it's their vaccine, but they're not accepting our vaccination. <clears throat> well, look at it this way. Jamaicans will want to travel between Jamaica and the United Kingdom, but... Hmm, Lots of things happening, but we welcome everyone to One Jamaica again today. It's a beautiful Thursday here in Kingston, Jamaica. The rains make it more interesting. People, please don't drive over flooded gullies and flooded waters. Regardless of rumors to the contrary, many cars and even high, you know, the high-end vehicles cannot manage those gullies and rivers. when they're, People go read little news, draft up something on Google and check. It can't work. And I like a bike, man. With the greatest regard to you, you should have known better. You know, for me, no matter how they deliver late and the boss will go crawl with you, drive round. They're ridiculous, eh? Yesterday, September 29, and I was in a class with some of my students, and I reminded them of it and drew up a news item from the Observer to show them 10 years exactly yesterday, September 29, since dancehall artist Vibes Carter was arrested for possession of marijuana and then later charged after that arrest, eh? With murder, confessed to murder, and all the things, and then, of course, he was finally convicted. But yesterday was the day he was arrested on the marijuana charge, 10 years, and he has been locked away since since then, 10 years to the date. Was there something I was supposed to do with my life? That's the thought for today as a question. If we keep on waiting until something happens for us to feel alive and full of purpose, we are missing out on life. If we keep on putting off moving forward, we are keeping ourselves stuck in needless misery. Today I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry it through. Was there something I was supposed to do with my life? People ask yourself the question, and if you don't answer it, maybe you want to answer it, go do something about it. Welcome back, welcome back, and we are in our constitutional speaking feature, and of course we are getting the public defender online, and remember that we are going to speak today about the plight of inmates with mental health issues. Reports are that approximately 262 inmates have been diagnosed with mental disorder, and that presently there is only one full psychiatrist in a penal system, the total population of around 4,000. Recently, Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of National Security, Mattis Muda, announced that the Department of Correctional Services is to hire an additional assist a consultant forensic psychiatrist and of course we also want to put into the mix some of the cases that came to all to that light recently remember the case of that 81 year old man noel chambers mentally ill man came in into the news last year he died after being incarcerated for 40 years without a trial mentally ill unfit to plead every time he was called up we have had other people williams there for 16 years mentally ill so we have a lot of cases that individuals who are mentally ill have not been given due Justice and Chambers' case in particular brought, I mean, a lot of Jamaicans to an understanding of the issues that surround inmates who are mentally ill and some of the challenges inside of the prison system. And so the public defender, Arlene Harrison Henry, is here to speak with us this morning in our Constitutionally Speaking feature about this issue. Good morning, public defender. Welcome again to One Jamaica. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, I am trying to be good. I'm trying to be good. With me, yes, at this time is Mr. Victor Hemmings, yes, and um, Mr. Mackenzie, Deputy Public Defender, yes, is to join us. Oh, he's oh, Mr. He, Mackenzie's not there as yet. Not, not, no, he's actually on the road, yes. but he's prepared to join us. And I've asked your producer to link him. To the program she's so she's on. working to bring him on i see her Great. working behind the screen so but uh, while we are waiting on sure. mr he mr mckenzie um you and, and mr hemmings can of course work through with us our listeners about sure. this issue so tell us a little bit um public defender um your thoughts about the issue of mental health in our state prisons that's a big issue it's a massive issue yes and it's an issue that we submit 
is an indictment on all of us, mm -hmm. um, and that is all of Jamaica. The yes. fact of the matter is that for years we have had persons in custody, many of whom are unfit to plead. Yes. And and let and public defender for our for our listeners, what does the term mean when they say means. unfit to plead? Yes. Meaning that by reason of a mental disease mm -hmm. or a mental illness, they cannot say, they cannot answer to the charge mm -hmm. that has been put or proffered against them. Mm -hmm. So in other words, by virtue of a disease of the mind, yes. what the law call a disease, um, a mental disease yes. they are not able to stand before the court and the clerk for instance read out the charge and then ask the question are you guilty are you not guilty yes they do not have the mental capacity to be able to make a determination as to what is what and then the court would ordinarily mm -hmm. refer them for a psychiatric evaluation, an assessment of their mental health and their mental status assessment. When they come back mm -hmm. as unfit to plead, they are remanded in custody yes. on many occasions. And, you know, I'm going to say something which, may not be the most forensic expression. Mm -hmm. Many of them stay in the system and become lost. As happened, for example, with Noel Chambers, who was there as, for 41 years. As, and, and he's not singular. And, and But we're using him as an example because he was we're there on a charge. An I think he was there on a charge of using a stone to break somebody's windscreen. It was something very, in, in, in a real thing, very negligible. But he was brought before the courts. He was, he was, he was incarcerated right. and brought before the courts for that. And lost, and as you say, a public defender got lost in the system. Um, Can you imagine something like that? So let me explain yes. the policy framework that exists for mm -hmm. those persons mm -hmm. who are unfit to plead, such as Noel Chambers. Yes. And I will say to you, there are several others who may have cracked a windscreen, mm -hmm. may have committed what we would call a common assault, Meaning, uh, you know, I'm not saying a, a relatively small yes. transgression and they are locked up. Mm -hmm. What is the process for them to come back before the court? Yes. Sir. After the assessment, that is a psychiatric assessment is made, mm -hmm. the person comes back before the court. Mm -hmm. The court makes an assessment looks at the doctor's findings, because it has to be a psychiatrist yes. who makes this assessment. The psychiatrist concludes mm -hmm. by virtue of his study and his analysis that this person is unfit to plead yes. by virtue of a mental disease, a mental illness, yes. and a disease of the mind. He cannot he doesn't understand the charge that has been brought before him. He cannot, therefore, offer an explanation. Mm -hmm. he, he's not mentally capable of engaging in a trial. He's incapable of giving instructions to his lawyers to say, this happened or this didn't happen, or this is what I did. Mm -hmm. And I think I hear Mr. Hemmings saying something in the background. Did I hear Victor Hemmings make a comment there? I um, don't know, but okay. he's certainly yes. at liberty to join us. Yes, sir. Yes, Victor. Good, good morning. Hi, morning, um, yes. Good morning to all listeners, and um, we're happy to be here. Um, it, it, to break it down, really, mm -hmm. it's a situation where um, the person because of a disease of the mind, would not be able to understand the, 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 what the judge is talking about, yes. what the lawyer is talking about, that's a prosecution lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as a result, he can't be 
fairly put before the court to answer to those charges if he can't even understand the charges. Yes, sir. And, and of course, our justice system has to be certain, our justice system has to be fair. And if, if he's not going to understand the charges, mm-hmm. it would be unfair for him to, uh, um, to, to, to answer to them. Yes. But, Professor, mm-hmm. what is ironic is that though our system is to be fair, transparent, and certain, and all those things, when you are unfit to plead, you are basically remanded. And you are supposed to be brought up for review. The fact is that if you cracked a windscreen, it is unlikely that you would have gotten a custodial sentence. Usual, and and this is usually this is exactly this is what we would expect. You know? yes. So what we're saying is that yes. ironically, yes, though many of the transgressions are small in the scheme of criminality in Jamaica. Yes. In the scheme of criminality in Jamaica, the infractions are small. Yes. They end up spending their lives in custody. And why so does I this was, happen to a public defender? Because I'm it's com- yes, becoming... Yes, that is what I was saying. Yes, so, yes. I'm this to- is yes. the policy arrangement. Yes. The Legal Aid Council, according to policy coming from the Ministry of Justice, Yes. Um, received funding and received training to treat with these issues, to get these people out. Let me break it down further. Yes. The Department of Corrections is to generate a report every month. That report is to be shared with court administrators and the legal aid council yes and it is to be shared so that these persons who are unfit to plead their cases can be brought back before the court yes for the court to review their circumstances of being in custody now there is no doubt that that has broken down over the many years mm-hmm broken down and that is why even now we have persons who are in custody and who have been in custody from 1975 Nin- one of the 46 uh, years and that's 1975 was 46 years ago um that's yeah. all i mean anyone born that time some of some people are grandparents now i know people born 1975 who are grandparents now so you we are yeah. we, and and the report the report shows that approximately 262 inmates have been diagnosed with mental disorders and of course minister samuda outlined that the um inmates are usually held indefinitely in the penal system not in mental health institutions but in the penal system until they are able to undergo a trial and complete the judicial process um how does this impact on the, the process of justice and you know the the, the, the um, well well how does it impact on it well well first of all yes someone who is mentally ill mm. or not to be in any penal institution exactly. someone who is mentally ill needs to be in a hospital and if not a hospital, mm-hmm. a facility yes. where that person can be treated. The mentally ill, mm. I would say, the condition of his mental health can only deteriorate yes. if he's in a mental facility and not receiving the care that is required. Yes. For his mental illness. So, you know, you have diabetes. You know, you have to have a certain kind of diet. You must take a certain kind of medication. You must do a certain amount of exercise and so on. For a long time now. And, you know, public defender, I have a question, have a question <laughs> coming in, you know, sure. because yes. I have a question coming in. And I'm not yes. sure if you have the answer. Maybe Minister Samuda would come and speak with us at another time. But I'm um, right. asking if Jamaica offers outpatient treatment for nonviolent prisoners where they are supervised by the court but do not serve time in prison. I'm not sure if you have that, that answer. Do we offer outpatient treatment for nonviolent um, um, persons? Pris- pris- no, no, we don't. 
<sighs> but, but let me finish, though, Professor Ho. Yes. Let me finish, Professor Ho. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is that for many years now, civil society, and I can speak for the independent Jamaican Council for Human Rights, mm-hmm. and this Commission of Parliament have both called for the establishment yes. of a forensic psychiatric unit for those inmates Mm -hmm. who are, who find themselves with a mental condition. The fact of the matter is too, and I don't have the statistics. Mm -hmm. Persons, I believe, would go in to those institutions perfectly well and become mentally ill by virtue of the environment Yes. In which they are placed. Yes. And that occurs we, in other dispensations, not just in Jamaica. That's something that occurs across absolutely. the world. Absolutely. Yes. Across the world where yes. the pain of incarceration. Yes. And and me, and we have all felt some measure of it with lockdowns. Ah, yes. So when we feel that pain and total unhappiness. Because we can't go out, we can't do what we want to do today because there's no movement there. Mm -hmm. Think of those persons who are completely deprived of freedom. That does not mean to say, you know, Professor Ho, Mm -hmm. that where a crime has been committed, people are not to be punished. Mm -hmm. Punishment, however, is not the only reason for someone to be put in a facility we have other conditions that the state and correctional services must look at rehabilitation um restoration reintegration in the community community. and 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 public defender have a question coming here from someone in florida Mm -hmm. and i suppose they're looking at it from the kind of u.s situation why you can't get a public defender if you can't afford to pay a lawyer like in other countries like the usa and i think they are talking when they say public defender they are not talking about the office that you hold i think they are speaking more to having an attorney uh maybe like what we would call legal aid here someone who would be working on behalf Yes. So the answer to that question is yes. that the Legal Aid Council yes. is funded to provide legal aid assistance mm-hmm. to those families and persons. We too, yes. Professor Ho, mm-hmm. we too have engaged in the process yes. of getting persons out. Though the arrangement, the arrangements between departments and agencies of government is for the legal aid council who receive training and funding to do that. We have jumped in and we have investigated in the first instance, we undertook the investigation of 44 we have since undertaken another um, 40. And what it, we have found yes. out in the fields is that many families do not want the inmates back at home. Oh, so the families are so, not pushing. So in a lot of ways, what you're saying, public defender, based on the, what, the, the, what you have researched and what you have found from your office, the office of the public absolutely. defender, is that the families are not, there's no push factor from the families from the outside to get the inmates out. And that probably is one of the reasons why they are there. And we're told that we can't get, we are trying to get Mr. McKenzie. We're still trying to get him. All right, that's fine. Yes, so you're saying um, that based on your experience and the work that you have done in the public defender's office with about 80 or so, you're saying 40 and 44 different yes. enemies that the families are not pushing to get them out not pushing at the that system so that might be one of the reasons as well why they actually get lost and put the words in quotes that is correct because it's left so, up to the state to make whatever decisions they make th- that is correct mm. of that eight yard oh. that we have investigated yes approximately 25 percent of families of that 88 mm want these inmates back home 
Mm-hmm. And what does that speak to? So 22 it, out of 88, so that leaves that about is, 66 people whose family members are not keen and or even interested slightly to have them back. And, you know, one of the things, you know, public defender, we're hitting right back at the issue of how, as Jamaicans, we respond to mental health challenges among our families. That's what I was coming to. Yes. That is what I was coming to. It is a scorning mm. and ostracization yes. of those of our families mm-hmm. who have a mental health issue. Mm-hmm. So we don't want them back. Yes. The, the government must take them, so to speak, and look after them. Usually that, so, yeah, that is usually the response. And we had the case of a 25-year-old man from my community, Linstead, who was on the streets, violent, harming people. And his family kept on pleading for someone to take care of him. And he killed a policeman last week you know, hit him in his head with a stone. And, of course, we are told that got reports that he was shot and, and all killed in, in subsequently. But, again, he was on the streets in Linstead for quite some time, harming people, harmed a pregnant woman. Somebody's fingers got cut off, chopped. He harmed several people in the activity because he was being violent. And his family yes. kept pleading, you know, sending out pleas to the public sector, to the government to come and deal with the issue because maybe they were above, it was at the wa- that water was apparently way above their heads because he was being violent and so he was on the streets. But Well, you know, Professor <sighs> Hope, there are mm-hmm. mental health clinics mm-hmm. across the island yes. where the family might have been able to have gotten help. Mm-hmm. Um, the other aspect of mental health Yes is not only the family's response. It is just the um, stigma Mm -hmm. that this country has towards anybody who is different. Forget mental health. Anybody who is different Mm -hmm. or perceived to be different, we have a problem with them because we are the ones who know everything. Mm -hmm. So there is a lack of adequate public education, we would say, in um, knowing mental health. But not only that, you know. Yes. It is detecting it from an early stage Mm -hmm. in the person's life. In the same way that you want to make an early detection of cancer or an early detection of diabetes or some other illness. But, you know, public defender, that... Society's attitude but public defender you know in our yes. culture culturally in our society um individuals who are a bit eccentric or a bit you know out of there in their behaviors people tolerate them and say well i saw him stay so she stay and even people who sometimes have a little break here or there sometimes persons have a little psychotic break here or there many times many times they don't even seek any kind of medical help or any assessment you know they just work through it and go on because again maybe for some t- people the cost of the of the medical attention they don't have the resource and this is how we look at it and even for other health issues that you're raising but the, the challenge with mental health in our country is one the stigma and also many times the fear of violence that is associated with it sometimes and, and that's true everyone listening in on the program right now has had an encounter with someone a family member or a friend who has suffered from some type of mental illness but again also some of the, the range of mental illnesses that are around us many times individuals are not aware of them what that it is actually a mental disorder for example depression is a very big one and people struggle with it and suffer with it so public education as you rightly say public defender Arlene Harrison Henry is one of the important ways forward to deal with this scourge absolutely but yes. Professor Hope yes while that young man out in your community in Linstead yes in Linstead committed acts of violence I want it I want to state um, in the clearest manner. Mm. It is not the mentally ill who are causing the murder rates to spike to over a thousand. Definitely even not. as we are in um well the last day of September it is not that group. But in terms of the lockups and the prisons mm-hmm. we have others who are aged aged prisoners yes. who um, we had asked at the start of the pandemic 
yes. if we could review on a case by case basis the relief of some persons, if only to provide more space in facilities. Mm -hmm. We had asked for the expediting of the parole process yes. where cases can be reviewed. Those who can go home, go home. Uh, of course, on conditions, as the parole board would see. Yes. And we want to say very clearly, you know, we're not asking for the exodus of persons in the correctional facilities back in the community. Mm -hmm. We're asking for a thoughtful review of cases. We have some very aged prisoners. Yes. And but you and know, public many defender. Many of whom are ill, perhaps but, not mentally ill now, but ill, but just physically ill. Mm. But you know, public defender. One of the questions that I would put to you, and I'm sure you know, maybe you don't have all the information, is that again, will families be there to receive some of these persons? They have been out of the society for twenty years, thirty years, forty years. And when I read stories of persons, many coming back here after being removed from other societies, and or persons here in Jamaica who have been in prison for twenty, thirty years. When you read the stories, when they return to the formal school society they have no no family there to receive them or no family there willing to receive them which works out to be the same thing same thing yes. so let me tell you what we suggest yes where a state has kept someone in custody for such a long time mm -hmm. an inordinately long time mm -hmm. The state has a responsibility of resettling and relocating them. And reintegrating and, them. Yes. And reintegrating them and providing services for them. Yes. We, we can't have an aged population. I, I mean, these people, some of them have been convicted. I know old men, you know, um, mm -hmm. some of them require things like pampers. And adult, adult, us, adult and, diapers, and, and, they're called, yes. And, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, but we sorry. know what you mean. I'm just saying it's I'm adult. sorry. But it, I, but it these, comes to us in, in using the word pamper, yes, but adult know. diapers. But, you know, you know, public defender, all these things you're talking about, you know, are going to cost somebody some money that they are not interested in spending. I, <laughs> I'm well aware of that. Yes. You see, our governance structure, <sighs> yes. we need to be more sensitive and responsive. Yes. to those who we hold captive. You, you see, right now we're working mm -hmm. to get out another two yes. who are mentally unfit to plead from, and they are both in custody from 1975. Mm. And both now have COVID. Yes. Right? And, uh, I mean, no matter what you did, Yes. I've been spent 46, 45, 46 years in custody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time that you could be released. And in, in the two cases, yes. family, the families are willing to take these persons back. Yes. And, and that is one, two cases that we're now spending time on. We have had to assist the lawyer handling it to say, the matter can still go before the court, though the inmate is in hospital. Okay. Because it is a matter that you want the court to be seized on. Yes. Court don't have to look into the person's face mm -hmm. to assess the evidence and the material that you have that advanced is, yes, yes. for the release of the individual. Mm -hmm. So we got an agreement that those cases would now be filed. You see, we don't file the cases, you know. Not yes. all. Yes. <clears throat> as you know, as public defender, I'm actually prohibited by statute to appear in court. Yes. So what we do is that Mr. McKenzie has been very helpful mm -hmm. to the office in filing and relisting many of the matters. Uh, and and, as the, and he and Mr. McKenzie is the deputy public defender. Deputy public yes. defender. Yes. And we lays with legal aid counsel mm -hmm. to um to discharge your mandate. 
And I have a comment and I have a comment and I have a comment coming in here from a listener, sure. um, public defender. Jamaicans, um, because of the crime rate, Jamaicans are fixated on death penalty and punishment without considering the mental health of prisoners. And um if you want to comment again, some of sometimes the mental health challenges are exacerbated or made worse by substance abuse. Um, and then there's another question saying that we need a comment asking why aren't we recruiting more mental health personnel to work in the prisons? Not just not really psychologists mm -hmm. or psychiatrists, but just people who are trained to deal with mental health issues. And I think um, that's one of the things that Mattis Samu, the minister without portfolio in the Ministry of National Security, um, was suggesting because we only have one one. Psychiatrists. Aren't they meant? But we have mental health professionals who are being trained, um, and should be able to also be recruited to work. It's because we don't. It doesn't necessarily take a full, you know, full blown psychiatrist or psychologist to work in a mental health. Um, you know, to assess and to to assist with the mental health issues. So a lot well, more needs to be done in that regard. Uh, Professor Hope, let me tell you what we found yes. out in the field, because when we investigate a matter we go to the homes mm -hmm. of the mentally ill yes we go to the communities we identify the community health center mm -hmm. and we identify the services yes. that are offered there because what we do we also get the medical records the mental health records yes. of the inmates and of course with the permission of the family provided to the mental health workers in the community. Mm -hmm. What we have found is that there is need for greater integration mm -hmm. between mental health workers and the community mm -hmm. and greater need for the community participation in the mental health process. Yes. So we're not throwing stones or Casting blame, there is somewhat of a disconnect. You see, when you have mental health mm -hmm. issues, you, in the same way that you and I need to trust our doctors, yes, sir. a mentally ill person, you need to be able to secure his trust. Yes, sir. And we need more of that. This is just my layman's opinion, you know, based mm -hmm. on what we have seen out in the fields. There needs to be a greater, greater interlinkages mm -hmm. between the mental health community professionals and the mental health in the community, plus mm -hmm. the mentally ill in the community, plus mm -hmm. Professor Hope. Yes. There is need for economic activity. Mm -hmm. So somebody may have a mental health problem. It don't mean he cannot work. Say depression, yes. work, I would want to believe, may be good. Oh, you know, for Help, somebody. It helps somebody who is, yes, it does. But you know, public defender, we're coming to the end of the of the discussion here, and um, we just have a we have a final question. It's thirteen minutes before eleven o'clock here in Kingston, yes. Jamaica. Um, the issue, what the issue may not is not is not unique to Jamaica, but of course, you know, throwing it out for our listeners. Why is it important to have proper systems and structures put in place to ensure and to protect the constitutional right of all the inmates who suffer with mental disorders? Why is this important? Important to have these structures put in place, whether they say mental health structures, you know, the legal structures to assist them to ensure that they are properly um, taken care of into the system. Why are they important um, for our for our mentally ill inmates? Let me first of all say to that listener: Yes, it is well known mm -hmm. that mental health is an issue affecting millions of people yes. around the world. Our situation is not unique to Jamaica, yes. but as public defender of Jamaica, I speak about Jamaica because I believe I have intimate knowledge mm -hmm. of our situation. Yes. Now, why we need proper governance yes. and the proper sharing of information mm -hmm. and dovetailing of activities is exactly to protect the rights of persons who come into custody, and yes. particularly those 
who themselves cannot protect your own rights. Yes. So the mentally ill is vulnerable and indeed and in fact way more vulnerable yes. than the average inmate because he cannot protect his rights because by virtue of mental disease. His mental and thought processes are not normal. Yes. So he needs, and, and it is a governance structure and framework, the governance collaboration yes. covering all ends that is needed to work well between legal aid council, corrections, Mm -hmm. Ministry of Justice, the courts. I tell you something, Professor Hope, to mm -hmm. that listener. Mm -hmm. It is only since we went out into the field yes. that we got a few complaints from that group of persons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And, and and I suppose, and you know, one of the things that is coming as you keep speaking, public offender, we are at the end of the discussion, but that the issue of public education is also critical so that, you know, individuals on the ground can connect the issues and the rights of individuals, regardless of how, you know, their mental state is, with the need to have these robust and very well pro provided for, you know, structures in place to ensure that people are taken care of when they are in and when they are out of the penal system. System, but even more so that their rights are protected throughout this process Absolutely. so that we don't people don't get lost in the system until they are 81 they are in their 40s and, 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 and their lives wasted mm. because you cracked a windscreen mm. when you're a young man yes, it, so it, it is ironic mm -hmm. that you know the, the system works in a way mm -hmm. because for cracking a windscreen Professor Hope Yes. You would have been more than likely fined. More than likely. More yes. than likely. You may have been asked by the court to replace the windscreen, but it wouldn't have cost your entire life for 45 years. And public defender, as we go from the um, from the discussion, any last words on the issue for our listeners? I, I think Mr. Hemmings yes. has asked, the last word. Okay. Thank, right. thank you so, so much. Yes, Mr. What, Hemmings. What we need yes. to understand, Professor, yes. is that a uh, disease of the mind, one is afflicted with a disease of the mind, mm -hmm. right? They are not beyond help. They can, some can completely recover with the proper medication and the proper support system in place. Yes. There are persons, <laughs> you know, that you may see walking up and down, living a normal life. But some of these persons were once affected in that way. Yes. So it's not that, we're, that, that these persons should be ostracized. They're not beyond um, help. And we, as a society, um, should do our best because you don't know when someone will become afflicted in this way. Indeed. And, and, and the very final word yes. is that we know that many conditions can be controlled and they need a regime of management yes. for, in the same way that we control diabetes, yes. we can control many other ailments like schizophrenia yes. and some of the more serious mental health um, challenges, yes. conditions yes. that Jamaicans have. Yes. It's all over the world. Yes, indeed. And particularly in this pandemic period, I believe, that more persons have slipped <clears throat> into, is it depression, is it sense of loneliness, sense of isolation, mm -hmm. and so on. And it, mental health is not something that we take as, a, as serious as a country. You know, we believe, oh, they will get over it. Indeed. Not so. And again, public defender, it comes back. We still hear ringing in the back of the discussion that there's also a great need for full public education around these issues. We have to leave Absolutely. it there and, and, and go. We have been out of time for a bit. Um, but thank you so much, you and, of course, Victor Hemmings, coming from the Public Defender's Office, Public Defender Arlene Harrison-Henry, and, of course, Victor Hemmings, out of the Public Defender's Office, speaking with us today about mental health issues and the plight of inmates with mental health issues and, of course, the rights, the constitutional rights that need to be protected as a part of the way we 
you look at this specific issue here in Jamaica. Thanks so much, Public Defender. Thanks so much, Mr. Hemmings. Have a great day. All the best, and thank you for having us. Thank you so much, indeed. And of course, thank you so much. Of course, speaking there in our constitutionally speaking feature, and of course, one thing that before we go quickly, the one person said their human rights are also being violated because they have the right to medical treatment, especially when they are in the system. We're going to go for a break. Stay with us. The program is One Jamaica. I'm Professor Donna Hope. Stay with us. Is we are in our culture matters feature, right? And we're talking with the program director at New York Edge and a youth and community consultant, Lawman Lynch. And I'm going to go and read some of the things about Lawman. For people who don't remember Lawman Lynch, remember Lawman Lynch? Lawman Lynch has been actively involved in youth and community development since age seven when he was here in Jamaica. He is recognized as a people's advocate and educator development and communication strategist and he's also an entrepreneur and before he migrated to the United States of America, Lawman served as regional trainer of citizenship education as part of the education transformation team at the Ministry of Education here in Jamaica and he has served as, as center and programs director at the Salvation Army in Brooklyn, New York, and is currently, as I said, program director at New York Edge, which is the city's largest social and after-school educational and enrichment service provider. He's an author, musician, and an award-winning youth and community development activist, and is the recipient of the CSJP Community Development Award, the Prime Minister's Youth in Excellence Award under the Leadership category, and one of New York Caribbean Life's newspapers, 20 Under 40 Trailblazers, and he's also the founder, the founder of the Lawman Lynch Foundation Incorporated, which is a New York based nonprofit that focuses on child, youth, and community development supporting programs both in the U.S. and Jamaica. Lawman, I can't say no more. Me, 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 I think you had a chance to talk because you know why? It's just oh, a over thing. Oh, you do, Lawman? How is it good to see you in the Zoom? Let me pick Yes, it, it, it's good to see you. Finally, I get to speak with you. Yeah, um, how, you do, how, how you doing, Lawman? I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing great. How are you? I am fabulous and good to see you because I mean, I mean, I see you online now and then, but yes, getting yes. to see you in this way is good to see you. Um, and good how, to see you. Yes, man. How long? You have been away from, you have been in the U.S. for some time now. And tell us yes. about the way that you were able to integrate into the U.S. culture as a young black man from Jamaica. How was the integration when you went well, it was difficult, and I and I say to individuals often that the first year was um, probably my most difficult year. Yeah. Um, I have, have absolutely no relatives in the U.S. at the time, and uh, mm -hmm. so the transition was extremely difficult. I didn't have an aunt to run to for Sunday dinner. <laughs> it was all about you know fending for myself. But yeah. I knew that you know going back to Jamaica at the time was not the smartest move, so yes. I had to make it work. Um, it was a huge culture shock to an extent. Um, you know, it, the land of the free, the home of the brave, is not just a cliche. So I had to, I had to kind of adapt to the new way of life. Yes, New York is a cultural melting pot. Yes, we have a lot of Jamaicans and other Caribbean nationals here, but um, it's just, it was just a difficult process initially yes, yes, until yes. I got my yes. first job, of course. Until you got your first <laughs> job, yes. Um, I think, is there someone in the Zoom with an open mic? I'm hearing some feedback there. Um, and so, so what are some of the issues? Because you said there were several issues. What were some of the things that happened that, you know, caused the culture shock? Well, give us one example, just one. Well, people are not always um, who are what they seem. Mm -hmm. And I was originally told that, you know, I'll have somewhere to stay. I'll be able to stay for a month or two. Mm -hmm. But then by the second week, you know, you had to go. Amen. So I went through the process of literally having absolutely nowhere to stay, you know, and that's that to me is difficult because it you, when you're not when your mind is not settled, it's really hard for you to progress. Yes. And many Jamaicans who migrate tell the story, you know, in the U.S., in Canada, of basically almost being homeless for a brief period because yep. of the way that um, promises are reneged on. And after that two-week period, some people get a month, but two weeks or so, you start mm -hmm. to have to look somewhere. But we see that you have overcome that and you have moved ahead. And you are now program director at New York Edge and a youth and community consultant in New York. Talk to us about the, the, the journey to get there and what the role entails. Okay, so I started off at the Salvation Army as a 
community center director and a programs director there, um, where we offered enrichment activities for, for young people ages K to 12. So we focus on children in kindergarten all the way up to the 12th to the 12th grade, but now we focus also on individuals up to age 20. So mm -hmm. those individuals who may need remedial help, we provide that sort of help for them. And I started with the Salvation Army managing their program in Brooklyn, and then I became a specialist, a leadership specialist at New York Edge before I got this job um, as a programs director. So here we, mm -hmm. um, if we consider if we remember the shift system in Jamaica, where we had a morning shift and an afternoon shift, in most public school system, the school day, is, day goes up until six o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. So for the afternoon, the best way to explain it is almost like I'm the principal for the afternoon program, okay. right? And we offer after homework help, STEM, leadership, music, dance, math, all sorts of enrichment activities to support the academic work that students do throughout the course of the day. Um, it is DOE, which is the Board of Education um, supported. Uh, we develop the curriculum, the lesson plans, we provide professional development for our staff, payroll, the whole nine yards. Sounds like a very large um, portfolio, um, Norman Lynch, as a Jamaican in New York. Um, what is the most fulfilling part of being a youth and community consultant slash program director? I think the most fulfilling part is actually pouring into the lives of young people. Mm -hmm. We get thousands of young people passing through our doors on a, on a, on a yearly basis. Yes. And to see them develop, to see them move from elementary school to middle school to high school and move on to college and to excel in their careers and come back and say, listen, it was because of your investment in me why, why I am who I am today. Yes. That is what um, motivates me. That is what drives me. And that's what is the, that's the most fulfilling part of the job that I do. Wonderful. And it's good that you're finding something to do that fulfills you. Now, you, we are told that you also have a business. So starting yes. a business in a foreign country as an immigrant is not an easy feat. Tell us about the business and how were you able to achieve it? Well, as you know, the Lawman Lynch Foundation was actually started in Jamaica back in 2008. Yes. When I came here and I got on my feet, I ensured that it was registered as a bona fide nonprofit in America. And we do that, you know, because we believe that, you know, people in Jamaica really needs help, but we have to streamline the help that we give. Yes. So yes. we, it's going extremely well. We provide back to school grants, education grants. Um, we contribute to the, the nutritional needs of basic school children in Jamaica. And a lot of persons always say to me, why don't you post the pictures and stuff? But I operate a little bit differently and I like to maintain the dignity of those we support. So we do not yes. post everything. Um, but outside of the foundation, I'm a part of a new uh, for-profit initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm a social entrepreneur first, but this for-profit initiative is very important because we have to make money and the nine to five alone really doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, no other black owned company in North America provides the service that we are embarking on come next year. Mm -hmm. um, it is owned by people within the Caribbean diaspora. It is going to be Jamaican led. Even the development of the technological infrastructure of the company is being facilitated by a Jamaican owned company in Canada, Next Step Digital Solutions, NSDS. So I'm very excited about it. I, I can't speak much about but it right after now. All of that lawman is like, but, but listen to me now, lawman, after all of that, you're priming us up and then you just drop yes. us like that. Yes. No, I'm not going to drop it because I'm coming right back to Bridge 99 FM. With, with 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 all the details i really cannot give it all away right i understand now, ah. reggae month 2022 february 2nd 2022 will be the official launch and you'll be hearing all about it and you'll keep us up to date indeed so people Definitely. this lawman is giving us a little teaser there so we are well teased <laughs> and of course remember we're talking with lawman lynch um program director at new york edge and youth and community consultant so he's a social entrepreneur but he's also going into for-profit entrepreneurship and if you remember right. he's a jamaican who migrated to new york how long have you been up there now lawman you've been there um, it's 11 years yes. and two months 
and two months. You know, so it got left in eleven years and two months. <laughs> um, because of course the, the I, and I remember when you migrated and all of the you know, excitement around it. And it's right. really a, a, a pleasure to see that you have surpassed and moved beyond and are really thriving in the country, the land of opportunity. So, so tell us now, Lawman, because you also do many things. You're a musician, you're an author, mm -hmm. and you're very passionate as we see about volunteerism and philanthropy. Tell us about bal balancing all of these passions and interests. How do you manage to do all of that? You know, time management is extremely important. And mm -hmm. everything that you just mentioned mm -hmm. are things that I am passionate about. Yes. And once you're passionate about it and you're loving it, it really, you first, you don't have to be paid for it, for sure. Yes. Um, you really find the time to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've been able to manage my time wisely. I give my nine to five um, 100% as yes. to what is required. I used to function very well on four hours of sleep every day. But as I get older, you know, that's not very good. But I still try to um, fit in as much as I can um, in the 24 hours that I'm given. I tell people all the time, we all have 24 hours. We just have to decide what we do with those 24 hours. Yes. And being a musician and stuff, of course, I I'm not you you won't see me trying to get a record deal, but in church on a Sunday, mm -hmm. I play my instrument, I, I I do praise and worship, and so on and so forth. Um, I am actively involved in the music um department at the school that I work at, so yes. it it works, it works, and I enjoy it. It's passion. It's passion. What instrument do you play? I play wind instruments, so mm -hmm. it brass instruments. Um, if it has three valves, more likely I can play it. So, but but what my favorite is the cornet, or what many persons may, or the trumpet. Oh, um, okay. And if I I read music as well, so I can help myself on the keyboard. So mm -hmm. I'm good. I, I'm I'm okay with those. Mm. Um, and of course, you're an author, Lawman. So um, tell us about yes. your book, because I'm trying to find, well, I see a book here on, on, on um, um, Amazon with your name on it. You know, tell us about your book, your, your uh, books. How many books have you written? You've written more than one? So I've written one ch children's book. Yes. Um, it's called The Adventures of Kiko. And it takes into consideration various citizenship education themes that children should live by yes, and, and be supported by. It's called the adventures. Yes, of Kiko, that's it right there. <laughs> yes, the adventures of Kiko. Be the best that's, you. Yes. It's right, that's it. And that was published in about 2015. And yes. every now and then I forget about it. And then I go on on in my account and the royalties are there and I can pay my rent. So I'm not worried about it at all. It's there. Yes. And then there is actually a educator's guide Mm -hmm. to the adventures of Kiko that focuses also on civic education mm -hmm. and you know civic education well that we no longer have in our, our school system in well Germany. well the well the minister of education favor williams announced you know recently when she was giving the um you know welcoming us back for the new school year that they're going to be giving it's a kind of values and attitudes program i can't remember the name of it right now. but then we have something coming that will um help jamaicans to young people to understand their civic the rights and duties uh, so we, we have it coming back Awesome. So yeah. this book, um, The Adventures of Kiko, it, ha it, it has yes. a, um, a leadership development component to it and mm -hmm. an educator's guide that is also published. That is also published. And that's important in terms of adding value in the different ways that you add value. Lawman Lynch, so you're an author, you play music, trumpet is a big thing. You know what I mean? You have good lungs. When you play the trumpet and these <laughs> instruments, you have to have good lungs. That means you can't yes. smoke on them some dear people. You have to have good nah. lungs. And you also are very passionate about philanthropy, volunteerism, and you have a job, and you have you know, all of these things that you are doing. Um, tell us what, what kind of advice would you give to Jamaicans, young or otherwise, who want to start a business in the United States of America? If they live in America or they're in Jamaica and want to start one in America. Um, well, well, living in America first. Tell us about that because that is your experience. I think it is very important. The benefits afforded to, yes. you know, entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs of color, mm -hmm. um, there are lots of benefits, right? Um, and there's a push, um, especially in New York State, to give more 
to minority owned entre- minority owned businesses mm-hmm. so i believe you know we just have to make that bold and extra step to make it happen yes the nine to five works and i live comfortably um on my nine to five but i believe if i want if we want to provide generational wealth and we, we want to you want to advance to- more <laughs> Exactly, yeah. and, and contribute in a meaningful way to mm-hmm. where we are from. And I believe that the, the government can do so much and no more. Private sector in Jamaica can do so much and no more. I think the diaspora has a greater role to play in the advancement and the development of Jamaica. Yeah, and so. if we, with being an entrepreneur will just put you on, you know, a, a greater platform to do just that to be able to do just that and so <laughs> there are so what about a jamaican in jamaica okay it sounded as if you had some information about that as well who wants to start a business in the united states do you have information on that what would you suggest and uh, say on the united states the united states embassy website there there's there's some information about that but yes. if you have a business in jamaica if there's a like-minded business in north america yes. there can be partnerships there um and i think that is one critical way to go moving forward to forge partnerships between jamaican businesses and in, in in um in, based in jamaica and jamaican businesses in jamaican owned businesses in north america i think that's the easiest and best way to do it to do it and create those collaborations across the timelines of course norman Lynch, right. um and sounds as if you're doing many things and that you'll continue to do many things and as a jamaican in the diaspora um you know in a lot of ways they say 11 years and two months Yep. 11 years and two months doing your yeah. own part to continue to not just to ensure that you are you know elevating yourself and contributing to the, the united states of america where you now reside but continuing to contribute yeah. to jamaica the land of your birth um and to ensure that as you rightly say from the diaspora that you do your best to assist and to work for and on behalf of many of those who are still here in jamaica yeah. because the government and the private sector here in jamaica alone really can't do everything i mean i got some statistics we were having a conversation about for example the way that um remittance inflows had increased Mm -hmm. um in 2020 in the period i suppose it looks as if maybe there's um, something happening with um the covid19 and so we saw where the remittance um entities uh, in a lot of ways increased and the kind of changes that were happening the inflows of remittances to jamaica went up quite significantly in the last um period that um, was captured the statistics is coming out of the Bank of Jamaica. And Jamaica. so in a lot of ways, um, we see that, you know, we still continue to benefit significantly from what happens in the United States of America and other countries where Jamaicans reside in the diaspora groups there. So I want to thank you, Lawman. It's good to talk with you. Program Director thank at New you. York Edge and a Youth and Community Consultant, Lawman Lynch, um, philanthropist, um, volunteer, musician, author. Um, the little book is nice. A nice little book, author. And of course, a person who has done quite a lot of work here in Jamaica before migrating to the United States. It's good to see you. And you're going to tell us, you say on the 2nd of February, 2022 in Regimont, that is when everything will be launched. But you will give us something yes. beyond the teaser before we get there about this, Absolutely. the for-profit enterprise that you and others have, Caribbean people, a Jamaican-led company that you'll be working on for next year. So we look forward to hearing more about that from you as well. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Lafayne. Thanks, Shannon Dale. I appreciate it. Thanks to your listeners and viewers. And thank you so much, Norman, indeed. Take good care. Thank you so much. You too. Indeed.